gamification, is it killer or is it all filler? It's all filler. Let's go home. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, first of all, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you. And it's lovely to be here. Um, I'm sorry for all of the uh, te technology issues. Um, it turns out I should have registered for this event um, earlier, and I didn't. Um, so I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, so going back to the question, I think gamification is very powerful indeed. Um, but I think the term gamification is being co-opted by a, a very narrow set of viewpoints. You know, I think a lot of people think of gamification as getting badges, getting trophies, and things like that. And to me, what gamification really is about is tapping into the core incentive model that we as human beings care about, right? So to take a step back, one of the reasons why I think, you know, if you look around the world, like there's rewards everywhere. You know, you go to a coffee shop and you can get one of those little cards where you get stamps whenever you have a coffee and you get a free coffee. There's airline mileage programs and there's game, video game trophies and whatever else. And the reason why that works is because intrinsic in our consciousness, there is this desire for gathering resources. So rewards and reacting to incentives is very natural for us. Um, the tricky thing, I think, is identifying what do you want to reward and recognize and gamify. And what I like to focus on is what are the behavioral outcomes that you want to see in your community? So for example, if you want people to keep coming back or you want people to create content or speak at your events, we want to gamify those things. But I think there's a much richer way of set of things that you can do there instead of just you do this thing and you get a virtual badge on your screen, which I think are getting a little bit overused these days. So. Yeah, I found it very interesting that um, there's this concept of co-opting of terms. Like we saw this with Web3, which kind of feels like it's in that stage right now. But even before yeah. that, this notion of gamification and before that, um, community management in and of itself. What's the difference between that and social media? Isn't Twitter a community? That kind of thing. So it right. kind of feels like there's a lot of co-opted terms like that. Yeah. I agree with you. I also think, um, and this is not meant as a criticism. This is a criticism. Well, this is not meant as a criticism. This is a criticism. So de th therefore, it is a criticism. This is a criticism to all of us, I think. is I just think we can be more creative when it comes to this stuff, right? Um, um, there, there are way, uh, To me, in every group of people, there are things that people want, and there are things that people desire. And I think when we create that connection between behavioral outcome and, and reward, we can get really creative in things that we can do to make that happen, right? Um, and I feel like we've, we all kind of respond with the same things. Like, like I say, it's badges and it's trophies and it's swag and things like that. And I just think there's, there's, this is what I love about communities is I'm sure there's people who are watching this right now who have experimented with gamification and found something really surprising work for them. And that's why I think we can, I think the creativity around gamification is going to ramp up in the next couple of years. Sorry, I thought I had my mute on, sorry. I'm curious, what do you think it's going to look like in the future? So, I, I think what's going to happen more and more is I think we're going to, my theory is that we're going to swing between two very wide points with a pendulum, right? We're going to swing between no gamification where, where, uh, which I think is a mistake where we basically say, Hey, come to our community because we've put a lot of work into setting up this community. And, and we, we're doing a lot of work. So therefore, you should show up and join our community. And that doesn't work, right? We know that doesn't work as, as a general rule. And then I think the far swinger, swinging of the pendulum is where everything is everything's rewarded. And then I think the, the risk of that is you create a very transactional community. You know, you create a place where everybody expects something to be... Um, 
to have a reward attached to it. This is one of the things that worries me about Web3 um, is that I think there's a lot of merit in Web3. There's a lot to explore and to get excited about. But um, I, I worry a lot about providing tokens and, and, and money, essentially, as rewards to participation in communities because we see it consistently. When you apply any financial reward in any environment with a group of human beings, um, it massively changes the behavioral model. So to me, what we'll do is we'll figure out somewhere in the middle of, of that ground what it looks like. Um, and and I, I'll give you an example. Like, so uh, on Thursday, I'm going to be running, I'm going to run the first session of something called the Community Ignition Workshop. And these are four completely free training sessions that I'm going to be doing. We'll show you how to either build a new community or how to optimize an existing community. Uh, and I'm really excited. I've never done this before. Like, I've done a bunch of training in the past, but I've never done like four workshop sessions that are free before, where one leads to the to the next one. And one of the things I realized in doing this was I had some ideas of like what I want to cover, but I realized I don't know what my audience wants. So I kind of gamified it a little bit, and I and I said, you know, when you sign up, uh, you get access to my training platform. And you get points assigned when you complete activities. And the first activity when you sign up is go and reply to the email and let me know what you'd like to see in the sessions. And I had an absolute boatload of replies, which um, I just like cut and pasted them and dumped them into a coded document. And this is amazing levels of, of insight. Um, and it was, it, it was gamified. Like the, I think the reason why most people did that was because they signed up for it. There was a logical next step, and they got points for it. Even though they're internet points and they don't really mean anything, it triggered a response. It triggered a behavioral outcome. And that's just one example. And I think what we're going to find is the more we share these stories with each other, people will experiment and do lots of, lots of different things. Like there's a great company called Liquibase, and one of the things that they do is when people hit certain levels of participation in their community, they do something called a spotlight where they basically put together like a little square social media image and they talk about the person. They link off to a post in the community where they talk about the great work that they've done. And even though they're not saying, if you do great stuff in our community, we'll do a spotlight on you, people know it. And therefore, it triggers the behavioral response of them participating and engaging and coming back. So I think we'll just share all of these experiences and, and we'll, we'll start doing really cool stuff. One of our uh, one of our attendees has a really interesting observation. Hey, David, would you like to talk um, more about what you just mentioned in the comments? Let me get him. Where would he go? In the meantime, I can read the comment out loud. Uh, using game industry gameplay design to incorporate in business to. Uh, has led to success in the community. I found a lot of systems in games work perfectly if modified and made fun. Yeah. I think that's a super interesting point from David because um, uh, what I love about um, <clears throat> the era that we live in right now, without turning this into a Tony Robbins speech, um, <laughs> uh, is that we live in this world where we are no longer restricted by the access of information, right? So you get people who are experts in building games, and you've got people who are experts in building businesses, and people who are experts in building communities, and people who are experts in marketing, and people who are experts in running online events. And we've developed a culture of sharing where you know YouTube is packed full of this stuff, and Twitter and whatever else. So you can take learnings from, to David's point, of experts in, 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 in the game industry and say, that's super interesting. How do we apply that into another area? And that is something I think is really fun, is where you, where you go down the rabbit hole of something that is, a, is, is not particularly related to community, and then you apply those principles. And I think what happens is you get like... Um, Sorry, my phone's ringing. You get really interesting insights. And so long as I think we go into a science philosophy of like, let's test this thing. Let's see what happens, you know? Like I'm sure David has probably got three or four things that he, he could share. Say, well, here's one thing I learned. Everybody go and test it. And sometimes those things won't work, but that's totally fine. But years ago, I think 
you'd only hang out with the people who knew what you knew. And now I feel like we're, you know, beyond reading books years ago. And now I feel like we're in this world where we should all learn from each other and try different things. So we get this cool fusion in the same way that with music, I love listening to people who blend together dubstep and metal, you know, because you get something new. Hey, David, I, I made you a presenter. Would you like to, would you like to speak? Um, he should be there any second. All right. Yes, yes, yes. I think before we get David, before David hops on, I was wondering if you could talk about, I know you've worked with different types of communities. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about what the difference is or maybe the similarities you've seen and what works in a developer community versus what works in an association community that sort of thing. Um, mm. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think a lot of it in my mind is somewhat dependent on the focal point of the community. Like to me, every community has to begin with value. Like what are you providing to your membership? Um, because we live in a society where, you know, there's a billion distractions, right? Like people, your community is not just going up against other communities, it's going up against, um, you know, Netflix and other things. Um, so I'll keep this brief because I know David's on, but, um, you know, the, the major benefit that developer communities have over other types of communities is the unit of collaboration is freely exchangeable, right? Like you can, you can download code, you can download software, you can work on it, and you can share your changes. Um, it's hard to do that with people who build cars. You know, <laughs> you can't download a car. I've tried, it didn't work. And uh, um, so the unit of collaboration is different. So therefore the types of, I think the principles of gamification still apply, um, but what you incentivize and the behaviors that you want to see will, will vary, so. Thanks for having me everyone and letting me talk. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, so what I did was I designed uh, a program that for the community I worked with previously, and it pretty much incentivized employees to interact on the community. And a lot of ways is we found out is people find, a lot of people when they find that they're interacting on community, they find it menial. They are like, oh, I got to interact with community. I got to answer people's questions. I got to support them or such. I'm sure everyone has encountered that, right? As, as a community person. So I thought, Okay, I worked in the game industry before. I've why can't I'm a gamer. I love games. Like why can't I make this fun for people who don't know normally how to work with games and such? So what I did was I pretty much as you said before, it's like a lot of times you just have badges or trophies. I thought what would be cool is if you have like levels and such. Like make it so that you advance through levels and you make it so that you reward them when they gain levels. And it was a massive success. People loved it because they were like, and then they started this competition. I'm sure you've seen it where they're like, oh, we want to, they'll talk to each other. They'll be like, hey, I'm at this level. What level are you at? Oh, I gained this level. And I'm like, I gained this reward. And it's really turned into fun. And you got to be, as he said, badges are kind of this. Badges are a cool thing, but you got to have rewards that really kind of speak to them. Add in like cool pins and such. Like one of the things I liked was every time someone gained a level, I would personally say to them, hey, congratulations, I see you gained this level. If you add that personal touch, it's a lot more effective to people. People yeah. want to be recognized. I'm sure you see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. love what you're sharing there because... Um... It's funny you say that, David, because one of the uh, things that I've done, which is similar, is, um, you know, with a lot of my clients and students, uh, people use Discourse, you know, this kind of open source forum platform. And built into Discourse are what they call trust levels. So when you sign up, you're at trust level zero. And when you've read for about 10, 15 minutes, you go up to trust level one. And then when you have posted a bit, you've had something liked, you've liked some things, you go up to trust level two. And there's basically four trust levels. Um, and one of the things that I consistently do is when people get into trust level two, which is 
they've been showing up and participating a reasonable amount, which is kind of your leveling up uh, concept, is exactly what you said. It's like you send them a personal message and you thank them and you highlight them in the community. Mm -hmm. And again, to your point, I think it's less about it being the badge. It's more about that a peer in your community is recognizing you. And even though um, a lot of us don't want to be uh, enslaved to status, we are receptive to status. So knowing that you've hit this new level shows that you've experienced a certain amount of progression. And I think that's really powerful in people. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I love that. It's great to hear those kinds of stories. Yeah. And one thing I found is kind of like featuring them in sort of like weekly newsletters because I, right. you would have kind of like leaderboards, top 10 and such. And that would yeah. really make people feel like they were welcome. Yeah. The only caveat I would say there, I learned this the hard way, is when I was at Canonical and we were building the Ubuntu community, hmm. um, I had this brainwave one day, uh, which was, why don't we create top 10 leaderboards for every, all the different categories of participation, like bug reporting, writing code, running local events, things like that. And uh, a wonderful guy on my team, Daniel Holbach, who's based out of Berlin in Germany, he went and built all these leaderboards out. And then we released it, and it was a disaster. <laughs> and the reason why it was a disaster was because a lot of the people who weren't in the top 10 felt snubbed. And um, I think the principle was right, but the way we messaged it and the way we presented it was completely broken. So How I came up... I I understand that. So how I came upon that was I had the top 10 leaderboard and then I had a leaderboard under that where everyone else was featured. So oh, cool. you still you still had them like the top 10, but you had everyone else. So everyone's else name and even the people who didn't rank up, you still had honorable mentions. So right. you're giving them all recognition. Yeah, I dig that. It's kind of like Peloton, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Unless you're a, unless you're a maniac, there's no way I could ever get into like the top ten leaderboard on the Peloton. Like I just, you need muscles on top of muscles on top of muscles, and then you drink protein shakes all day. Um, so I'm like, you know, sixty five thousand on that list. But it's nice knowing where in that list you are, right? So. Yeah, and I and still, another... and still at the end, like when you when people are like reaching their point they they still get featured it's still kind of have like this grand like newsletter that comes out and says and every time even if they aren't in the top 10 if they still advance you still call them out so yeah. people know that their progress is being made that's the key because a lot of times people just call out oh someone has advanced into the community they just call out the the producers Every in my eyes, everyone is producer. It doesn't matter yeah. if you do only one piece of article and content, one knowledge base, one question answer, one forum post. Everyone is a valued member. No one is a number in the community. Yeah. So, how have you considered? Because this is something I've played with a lot. Um, doing leaderboards based upon value of contribution. Um, which I feel like a lot of social media um, is moving forward to. Reddit uses a vote up, vote down system. YouTube has the like button, right? But kind of taking that a step further, where we now have systems like Orbit, like we're moving into a new technological era for online community, where we can now use user sentiment and we can go beyond behavior. Where do you think that might go? So... I think that there's a lot of potential for that because, as you said, like, right, is using that down votes and everything. I think there are new ways we can measure points. What we can do is we can use analytics. I think we can actually find where people are kind of like where you need help, where you need like to kind of push in the community in the right direction. And we can use that to adjust points values, to kind of adjust how things are. To kind of make it so that it's easier to kind of either promote a community in the right way or kind of give a new rating system based off of that. What Because it's like not everyone has the same skills in a community. I'm sure you have some people over there kind of like 
kind of like some people are software developers, right? Uh, some people are salespeople. Some people are, they don't have it, but it's like, it doesn't really, it, for the rating system, it's not always easy to rate them all the same or their contribution. I know, as you said, like down, up, down, vote, but there are ways also that you can kind of find what their skills are to kind of address and push the community in the right direction by either making fun challenges or making things that right for them. Yeah. I think, I think one of the difficulties in my mind here as well is, is, um, you know, it's wonderful with these new tools like orbit and common room and Comsor and, you know, all of these different platforms that are kind of, uh, shaping up, but I think it's going to create, um, there, we run the risk of kind of overcomplicating the, the of overcomplicating the community experience potentially. Um, and the, I tend to, I tend to have to simplify the world so I can understand it in my own head. And one metric that I like, well, one, one uh, categorization of, of what to gamify in my head is, um, the development of new skills. Um, so for example, years ago when I, again, when I was at Canonical, um, I was at an event in, I forget where it was, some Ubuntu developer summit, and I was hanging out in a bar with a, a guy called Ted Gould, um, who was talking about, wouldn't it be cool if we had uh, gamified badges in Ubuntu? And I thought this would be a fun project. So I built this system called Ubuntu Accomplishments. Um, and um, we started out by just focusing on the v development of, of new skills. So the first time you report a bug, the first time you fix a bug, uh, the first time you submit a pull request, the first time you join a, an event, the first time you run an event, the first time you start a user group. And it provided, I think, enough for people to kind of glom onto, um, to start recognizing people. Um, we had some pressure from some people to be like, oh, when somebody has filed 100 bugs, then maybe they get something. And my worry with that strategy is, then it becomes a vanity numbers game and it doesn't become about, become about value in the community. Um, and what I'm really excited about, and I think discourse kind of blazed the trail here with their trust models is that the trust model that they built was not just based upon writing. It was based upon reading. Uh, it was a multidimensional way of, 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 of evaluating participation. So to get to trust level two in discourse, you have to, read a bunch, you have to write a bunch, you have to like some things, you have to have some things liked, you have to fill in your profile details. And what I love about that, which I think is Tavinia's point, is that the richness of that data provides a richer view of the community condition. But I think the challenge is that we need to be able to boil that down into simple, you know, to, to David's point about like leveling or whatever it might be, so people don't have to try and figure out what is the exact balance of the ingredients that I need to determine what some, somebody's going to be recognized by. Like I can only imagine the amount of work that Jeff Atwood and co went into to figure out what exactly defined trust level two in discourse. I'm sure tons of research went into that. I'm sure they didn't just wave their hands and kind of come up with it. At least I hope not. So that to me is going to be the real challenge that I think we're going to face. So. so I found that the best way to kind of like get ideas from and to kind of like ins inspiration is to, I know this may sound crazy, is to play games. Games have had since the 90s. That's where, that's where my passion, that's where my kind of industry was before I got into business and everything. I found that playing games, looking at their system, because they have, they as you said, psychologically, that is what gamification is really about is to kind of address things psychologically it's not about badges it's not about leadership it's how to do reactions from people in their community yep. it's totally psychological so games have that down to a key i'm sure you see mobile games they made revenue of there's several mobile games who just in a month made 900 million because people they have that way to pay to win just kind of spree people will just put money in swipe card get a loot box open it i'm sure you heard about from ea all these other articles on that it's those kinds of 
reactions are kind of what gamification does in many ways is to get people incentivized to just continually come back to the community because they get all those good feelings but we yeah, don't yeah. want we don't want to make a ton of money off of them but what we want to do is it's still the same concept in many regards you're psychologically making them come back to because they love being there we should probably move on to a uh, second comment. Uh, we actually brought Heather on uh, because it seems like it's an extension of that same conversation, right? Um, but this is a conversation about gamification that failed. Uh, I think that Ubisoft is a really good example, uh, their Star Wars debacle. Um, but there are also other more private, more local communities where a lot of this can fail. So Heather, do you want to explain a little bit of what happened? Sure. So first of all, um, the role, my first community management role, they came to me and asked me to be their community manager, but I had no idea that that existed. Um, I wasn't with the company. I, they sought me out. I still don't know exactly why, but they did. Um, so I had a lot of research to do. I had no idea what community management was all about. So read everything I could get my hands on, watched every webinar I could find. When I came in and started, they had an existing community. It had 91 different groups and they were averaging less than a post a day across all of those groups. It was not being used and probably 75% of those were staff posts. So I went through and had to do analytics, take a look what was going on, what was working, what wasn't, you know, compare that to what I was learning about what good community management and best practices were. And one of the things that I saw was there was this gentleman who had like 6,000 times the number of points as everybody else in the group. They did have a leaderboard and things like that because they just gave point a point for everything you did. So I would find him constantly, great, love it, you know, thumbs oh. up, whatever. They weren't mm -hmm. actually, he, there was no value added. Yeah. So when I set up, the new community, I had to take a look at, okay, do I want gamification? And if so, how do I prevent that from happening? We didn't have the ability to degrade points. I, I don't know if that existed and I just never found it. Um, my role changed from community manager full-time to like 10% of my role was community management and there was nobody else. So um, there wasn't a lot of time to dive into a ton of stuff, but the one thing that I was really pleased with is the leaderboard changed frequently who was on that leaderboard. So you saw different faces and you saw different names. And to me, you know, that was, that was awesome. And then we would do some highlights on people who hit the leaderboard and, you know, give them a little insight. It was an association and um, we had about 60,000 members. So um, it was, it was lovely to see engagement across um the audience increased, so it wasn't the same voices every single time. That's so interesting there, what you're saying, Heather, because uh, I think there's a couple of things wrapped up in there that are super interesting to me. Like one is, you know, this notion of rewarding everything. It, it, to me, it, like, it no longer becomes special, right? Is um, to me, there's like a baseline of participation. It'd be like, you know, you know, if I was to give every time my son said thank you, if I was to give him a dollar, he'd say thank you all the time, but it wouldn't really teach him anything. Um, and uh, the other element there as well in my mind is around kind of like point decay. Uh, this is one of the things that I think uh, uh, Reddit's done a reasonable job here with is that, you know, if you don't part if you don't log in for a while with Reddit, well, at least it used to work this way, I'm not sure if it still does, then, then your karma gets decayed. And, and in my mind, I like that because then your karma, your high score is a reflection of, of um, where you are reasonably in the moment. Um, with the caveat that you don't, you know, ding people's karma for things like women taking time off to have a baby, you know, <laughs> that would be very unfair. Um, but I think having a means where you can gradually show that, um, um, there are different kind of generations of community members. One of the things I've seen a lot of communities struggle with is where the old guard, not in terms of the age of the individual, just people who've been around the community for a long time, 
limit the ability for the community to change and evolve and grow because they're still considered community leaders, even though they haven't really done anything in a while. And I think some kind of reflection of that is really important. Otherwise, you become beholden to, you know, grumpy old people, again, not literal age, just grumpy community members who just want the kids to get off their lawn and they don't want anything to change. So, you know, one final thing which just struck me as well is I think this conversation, like David was talking about this as well, is we're talking about applying gamification principles into what into environments that people would not ordinarily consider to be a game, which I think is what's so interesting about this. And it reminds me of, I've been kind of really, I've been binge watching Shark Tank recently. And one of the things that Mark Cuban said in an interview is that business is the ultimate contact sport. Um, you know, like people think of basketball or baseball or football, or whatever, as a place where you go and train and you, you, you work hard at it, but you know, you know what the goal of the game is and you know what you need to do to be good at that game. You just need to get good at it. Whereas in business was, this was his analogy is that you don't know what the goal is. In many cases, you don't know what you're there to achieve or how to achieve it. And I think it's the same thing with communities. I'd say communities are even more complex than, than business because we're dealing with all of these different psychological elements that, that can impact. It's not purely about uh, accomplishing success in a market. So to me, it's fascinating when we apply these gamification principles into an environment that isn't typically a game. Elvis had um, a really interesting observation. Um, oh, um, who has it? Elvis, did you want to speak? Hello, Elvis. Elvis is one of the uh, members from the Information Diet Book Club. Um, Elvis, if you do want to speak, we can, but otherwise I'll go ahead and read out your comment. No, he can talk. He can talk now. Oh, oh. Right. let me fix it. Hang on. It's very wonky <laughs> today. Very wonky today. Um, it's just jumping around. I actually just got kicked out. Okay. Elvis, can you speak? Oh, for the love of Pete. No <laughs> I'll go ahead and read it out while you're getting that done. Uh, yeah. Gamification became the primary driver of the game mechanics uh, at the expense of story and plot, which is an interesting idea because when you connect that to regular communities, there's also that concept of we're here to do work. Uh, and then the model has become the same across pretty much all other games within Ubisoft. So each game felt the same and just felt like a different location, geographically speaking. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on that, Elvis? He should be able to speak. I just enabled him. <sighs> Elvis, are you able to speak yet? This has been one of this, the buggy days. <laughs> it's been a day for tech. The nut, hey, the tech. Here to screw us from time to time. Yes, yes. Keep <laughs> us humble. All right, um, Elvis, you should be able to do this. Um, goodness gracious. Oh, uh, looks like you do have another question, though. Um, don't see any audio buttons. So, uh, do we want to stick to that concept or move on to the next question then? Oh, <laughs> and we lost Lori. <laughs> so Elvis's uh, question for you is to jump off your recent point, have you seen any good examples of partnering with the community to define business goals? Um, even if the gamification model is already set up? Or even the yeah. gamification model to set up, I guess. So um, I have an um, underlying philosophy um, in the world that whatever we're trying to do, um, whether you're trying to build a community or a business or you want to be a musician or an artist or a cook or whatever, 
Um, I think there is very little new thinking in the world, um, which is a little bit depressing. Um, I think the vast majority of the answers to our questions exist in your audience. So to Elvis's question here, have you seen any good examples of partnering with the community to define business goals as one example is I think people who build a great community wrapped around a product or a service that those people know more than anyone about what your business goals probably should be is kind of my take on this. Um, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they were saying, they were asking me, how do you, when you build a community, how do you sell to your community members? And my response to them was, um, selling to community members is tricky and it's risky. But what you want to do is when you build a good community, in my mind, what you do is you create the conditions for the sale, right? So let's say, for example, you know, you've got an open source project and um, you bring people into the open source community and then they start using your project and then they discover that you've got a paid service that, you, that, they, that they can buy. If you've offered a lot of value to your community members, um, webinars, technical workshops, content, great email. Um, if you've done a lot of things we've talked about around, like David was saying about like leveling up, for example, and you've gamified it, you've created the conditions where somebody would want to do business with you because they've had such a good experience. Um, so to me, the question therefore is, is you talk to the community members and you say, what would, what would define the great, a, a great experience for you? And that's how I like to approach it. And I think lots of companies do this. Like we did this when I was at GitHub. We did this when I was at XPRIZE. I've seen GitLab do this. I've seen HashiCorp do this. I've seen all kinds of companies really be vulnerable with their community members and say like, what should we do to be better? And I think um, community members are the best people to, do, to give you that information because uh, even if they're super critical, they're critical because they care. So I don't think community members are necessarily great people to help you define gamification because they'll look at it from the position of the player as opposed to the game creator in most cases. But in terms of building a great business, I think they will have really great insight to kind of feedback on. The key thing in my mind is you've got to be vulnerable. You got to, and I like, actually like to be super vulnerable and say, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> and then you get good results. I have one more quick question. And that's like, how do you string together gamification if your community is on like different platforms? Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I um, have become a real fan of is, um, and maybe I can actually illustrate this real quick. Um, so one of the things I'm a, I'm a fan of is where, I don't know if my camera looks reverse for everybody, whether it looks the right way around. Does it look right? Correct to you? Yeah, looks all right. Yeah, okay. it looks really good. We it's yes. Birds I eye okay. hands. Also, I'm super jealous of the setup, but continue. You look <laughs> Thank you. So um, you know, a lot of people like when they um when they when they start out building communities, you know, like we I, I talk about this in my trainings, like you define who your audience is, we figure out what they're struggling with. So we define what their pain points are. And then like what I like to do is kind of your communities over here. Right. Um, and there's like three phases for your community. People start out as casual members, then they become regular members, and then they become core members. A lot of people say, okay, these people over here, we need to get them into our community right away. And so then they and they try to bring them into, into this part. And the worry that I have that with that is if you've got like random people out there on the internet um, who've got a pain point that you feel like your community can resolve or your software can resolve, your product can resolve. The challenge is to ask them to go into a community environment is a massive ask because communities are full of random people they don't know. There's a lot of imposter syndrome. They're not sure if it's going to be worth their time. There's a lot of detail they have to figure out. It's very complicated. So what I like to do is instead start them with a value proposition. This could be, um, this could be a, a workshop or a webinar or it could be an ebook or something along those lines where you basically resolve one of those pain points and you get them to that value as quickly and as easily as possible so they have a win, 
right? This is what I'm going to be doing, you know, with the community ignition workshop on starting on Thursday is my, my, my pain point that I'm trying to resolve here is how do you build a community efficiently or how do you optimize a community that isn't getting you the results? Now, this is where it kind of leads to Elvis's question is, you know, you create that piece of value. People can sign up with their first name, their email address. And then what you do is you give them really great email. Uh, and I love doing this, right? Because um, these emails, as so long as these emails provide value to people, um, um, people, I think, will then be open to the idea of kind of coming into your community, right, at a later point. So when it comes to gamifying people across different platforms, the challenge is here, this is a platform that you've defined. And this might be, you know, you might have Slack here, or you may have Discourse here. You may even have like, I don't know, Discord as well. The problem is, to Elvis's point, is it's very difficult to gamify these areas. But the grand unifier is email. So what I like to do is to then provide interaction opportunities and recognition opportunities within the context of email instead. So that's how I would recommend you approach it. The other thing I would say is, as a general rule, and this is a hard thing to, to do if you've already kind of got lots of platforms, is to limit the number of community platforms that you have. Because I think breaking people across multiple platforms is too complicated. Um, what I like to do is ideally have one platform. Um, if you can't do one, have one of each category of platform. So you may have, for example, a for like an analogy I like to use is you set up a forum like discourse as imagine the analogy is kind of like an event, right? The forum is like the conference where you've got all of the programming and the and, and, and the attractions that you're bringing people into your event. It's structured, it's organized, it's formal, it's thematic. And then your chat server like Discord or Slack or whatever becomes kind of the after event hangout. That's when people go down the pub, people go to a restaurant, people go to a coffee shop, because I think people in chat servers are much more social. Like I could imagine saying to Venia, like, how's your weekend on Discord? But I can't imagine saying that on a forum. It seemed weird. So <laughs> that's how I like to kind of balance the two types of platforms. Yeah, I was invoked. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that I would definitely extend that to is there's this explicit difference between communication that you own and communication that you've earned. And I think it's really important to recognize that the purview of social media and marketing is this larger community that your organization is a part of. And then there's the community that you own. There's structured communication happening here. So you can yeah. have what I recommend is about two platforms, maybe three if you want to count your CRM or your website. Uh, and really, all it is is the structured communication. Here are the rules. Here are the boundaries of my community. And then you have a second one, which is just more ethereal, low context kind of conversations. It's very difficult for them to necessarily get into, but it feels like an event. It feels like it's live. It feels like it's lively. And then you just yep. create what I call a transparency barrier which is you can see into these from the outside. You can join into them from the outside. But by and large, your larger community, that's all grapevine communication. Don't even try to control that. Just let the chaos ensue. Yeah, totally agree. Cool. Um, does anybody else have any questions or observations? I'm still it's very not. much in the what comes after the leaderboard. That's <laughs> kind of where I am. I'm like, how do we go beyond the leaderboard? What's yeah. next? So that's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm not coming up with much as of late. I can riff off of that though. Go for I it. Have a question. Go for it. So what comes after the leaderboard? I kind of feel like because gamification has gotten so far into the weeds, it's become this technological conversation of how do I set it up? How do I reward? How do I um, give someone after every single action that they perform? Um, how do we go beyond that to turn gamification into an automatic conversation that brings someone from extrinsic reward you've gained a badge to intrinsic value 
I feel like my interactions are truly meaningful in my community. Mm. You know, um, one, one thought here is, uh, I think one really valuable purpose of gamification in my mind is, again, we, we, we often talk about, I think the concept of you do a thing, you get a thing. Um, and I think to me, like where you're zoning in here, Vini, which is a hundred percent in my mind, the right place to, to zone in on is, is how do we generate that sense of belonging and fulfillment in the community? And how does gamification serve that? And my view here is that, um, I think rewards will, will get you so far, right? Um, you know, the, I forget. There was some scientific study years ago that found a connection between, I think it was rewards and arousal, something like that. And it looked a little bit like this. And I think this maps to, to, to this kind of topic, which is, you know, if this is the, um, if this is the contributions kind of down here, um, and this is the uh, reward value here, What's pretty common is as people kind of contribute more and you keep giving them greater and greater rewards for their participation, you get to a point where you reach like a peak here of value. Like this is when you start giving like laptops to people or in, you know, like really expensive goods and, and services within the context of that community, right? And the 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 point of this research was that when you start getting to that level of reward and recognition, people then are so focused on getting the thing that they don't actually, they're not really focused on the contribution anymore. They're focused on getting the thing. And I think that's the risk that we face with, with, the, with the standard gamification model. To me, what's really interesting about gamification is the ability for gamification to help us to sift through the noise to identify areas of opportunity for people to go beyond their current norms, right? So for example, um, I think everybody faces this problem with communities where let's say you've got a hundred people in your community. So not massive, but a, a decent number of people. Um, staying on top of what a hundred people are doing um, and identifying where are the people who have got real potential, where is their velocity increasing? is to me a goal that every community manager should be focusing on. Like, where do I see potential? And what I want to do is I want to use gamification as a means to, a mechanism to identify the behaviors that you want to see. And then I want some kind of light to go off in my office, like one of those spinning lights that goes on top of a police car that basically says, woo, 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 woo. Look at what Sarah's doing, right? Because Sarah's done three things in the last week that are particularly interesting. And Sarah hadn't done that previously because I want that light to signify that I then reach out to Sarah and say, Hey, uh, you know, my name's Jono. I'm, uh, you know, I'm the community manager here. Love what you've been working on. I'd love to get on a call with you for half an hour and have a virtual coffee and just talk about, you know, the work you've been doing and see what we can do to help you be even more successful in the community. So that Sarah doesn't necessarily get the reward, but I get the I, I get the notification that then triggers a human interaction. That to me is is a, a side of gamification that I think we haven't seen because consistently we see that uh, this, there was some research done by Spotify into their guilds program that um, the greater the level of personal contribution to a community resulted in the greater level of personal satisfaction in a community. So the people who did things felt a lot more satisfaction in the community than the people who didn't do things. And I think if we can have some kind of spinning red light go off when we detect different types of participation, so we see potential forming in a community, we know that one-on-one -on -one interaction and coaching and mentoring benefits the greatest level of reward. So therefore gamification can be a useful tool to connect us to the people where we can foster that, that, that potential. That to me is a super exciting element of gamification that we don't tend to talk a lot about. 
I agree. I agree. I think it's, sorry, uh, we do need to close up a little bit, but what I do think is interesting is the concept of a lot of open source conferences, like All Things Open, creating leaderboards explicitly because they know that their audience is going to break them. And then it just <laughs> goes from a, le a leaderboard to a total hackathon. Yeah. I think that that's very similar to what you're discussing, but sorry, Lori. <laughs> it's okay. Um, does anybody have any more questions before we close out this really engaging and really wonderful um, session with Jono? I've actually put in a shameless plug for his masterclass, which I am attending and I'm very excited about. So thank you, Laura. You're welcome. So um, I hope a lot of folks will go have a peek and um, see if that's you know something you might want to participate in. Um, now, if folks want to continue the conversation, we're going to have a little after party in um, Venue's Discord server. She's posted a link here. And um, thank you all so much for coming. And if you check your emails, I've sent out an email about some upcoming in-person events that you might want to join us for. And um, take good care. And thank you for coming. And have a great day. Thanks, everyone.